The automotive industry is buzzing with talk of new Buick products and high-tech power plants. Yet opening the hood of a new Buick is likely to reveal one of two power plants with a reputation for dependable service, the 2-liter and 2.5-liter Tech 4. Buick uses two four-cylinder overhead valve engines, the 2.0-liter and 2.5-liter. While the basic design is not new, the past few years have brought major changes worth pointing out. Let's begin with the second-generation 2.0-liter engine. Introduced in 1987, it is identified by the VIN Code 1. This design provides greater reliability, improved efficiency, and increased power and torque. Starting with the cylinder block, structural changes were made to reduce bore distortion. These changes are important because they permit precise honing of the cylinder bores, making it possible for two-liter engines to be fitted with single-size pistons. The single-size pistons are fitted with low-tension piston rings to help reduce friction. In addition, to compensate for the new shorter pistons, second-generation engines use slightly longer connecting rods. Two-liter engines use a cast nodular iron crankshaft supported by five main bearings. A notable change is the direct ignition system timing disc cast into the crankshaft. The timing disc triggers a magnetic pickup crankshaft sensor. A major goal for the redesigned two-liter engine was a reduction in weight. For that reason, an aluminum cylinder head replaced the cast iron head, saving 13 pounds. The aluminum head made it necessary to use valve guide and valve seat inserts for better durability. A second goal was to improve efficiency. To accomplish this, the combustion chambers are machined to provide more efficient burning of the air-fuel mixture, larger intake and exhaust valves are used, and the valves are angled or canted to provide the best possible performance. By alternately canting the valves, a swirling effect is created, resulting in a flame front that spreads rapidly to all parts of the combustion chamber. A few precautions must be observed when servicing aluminum heads. Remove gasket material carefully so sealing surfaces are not scratched. Do not use a wire wheel or wire brush. Do not use a hot tank or caustic chemicals to clean the heads as they may corrode the aluminum. Use carburetor cleaner or alcohol-based cleaners to clean aluminum cylinder heads. Spark plug hole threads may be easily damaged on aluminum cylinder heads. So, allow the engine to cool to room temperature before removing spark plugs. On severely carbon spark plugs, it may be necessary to spray CRC 556 or an equivalent solvent around the spark plug threads and slowly work the plugs out. When replacing the cylinder head gasket on the 2-liter engine, torque the inner cylinder head bolts to 73 to 83 foot-pounds and the outer bolts to 62 to 70 foot-pounds in the proper sequence. A timing chain, crankshaft sprocket, and camshaft sprocket are used on the 2-liter engine. The timing chain and camshaft sprocket can be removed after unbolting the camshaft sprocket. However, the crankshaft sprocket must be removed using puller J22888D and installed using installer J5590. Before installing the timing chain, compress the tensioner spring and insert a cotter pin or similar tool into the hole provided. The cotter pin keeps the spring compressed, making it easier to install the timing chain. Be sure to align the marks on the camshaft and crankshaft sprockets. The 2-liter engine uses a cast aluminum intake manifold with a common plenum and equal length runners. Coolant is circulated through passages in the manifold to speed throttle body warm-up. When installing the intake manifold, be sure to tighten intake manifold bolts in the proper sequence. The most visible change on the second generation 2-liter engine 
is the style casted aluminum rocker arm cover. A one-piece silicone gasket fits into a groove around the edge of the cover. Standoff bosses are used to prevent the gasket from being crushed from over tightening. A cast aluminum front cover improves sealing at the front of the engine. Like the rocker arm cover, a silicone gasket is used between the cylinder block and front cover. On the lower end of the engine, a wider rail and standoff bosses provide better oil pan sealing. A silicone seal is used at the rear of the oil pan. When installing the oil pan, apply RTV sealer to the side rails and front of the oil pan. A one-piece rear main seal is used at the rear of the engine. The seal must be installed using installer J34686. Start this operation by lubricating the new seal and sliding it over the mandrel of the installation tool. Then, align the dowel pin on the tool with the hole in the crankshaft. After installing the attaching bolts, tighten the T-handle to push the seal into the bore. Continue until the tool collar is flush against the cylinder block. The two-liter engine uses a single serpentine belt to drive engine accessories. An automatic tensioner eliminates the need for periodic adjustments. The belt can be easily removed or installed using a box end wrench to loosen the automatic tensioner. Since the water pump is driven off the back side of the belt, a reverse rotation water pump is used on two-liter engines. Starting in 1988, two-liter engines may either have a stamped steel or cast iron water pump impeller. Also in 1988, a stamped steel crankshaft pulley with a cast iron hub replaced the cast iron pulley. Use puller J24420 to remove the crankshaft pulley hub and installer J29113 to install the hub. Now let's turn our attention to the 2.5 liter engine. The 2.5 liter VIN R engine was introduced in 1982. This was an update of the Iron Duke engine used for many years. A second variation, the 2.5 liter VIN U engine, was introduced in 1985. The primary difference between the two engines is the length of the cylinder block. The second version, or VIN U engine, is about one inch shorter. Because many of the major components are also shorter, it's important to identify the exact engine to save an extra trip to the parts counter. When introduced, the VIN U engine was given the name Tech 4 because it included roller lifters, improved electronic fuel injection, fast burn swirl port design, and improved high energy ignition. The Tech 4 concept was applied to the first version, or VIN R engine, for 1986. However, both R and U, 2.5 liter engines, have undergone major changes since 1986. Let's look at a few. First used in 1987 on engines equipped with manual transmissions, the force balancer, sometimes called a counterbalancer, provides smoother engine operation by reducing secondary shake or the up and down motion produced at higher engine speeds. Although this characteristic is found on all four cylinder engines, secondary force is greatly reduced on 2.5 liter engines equipped with the force balancer. The balancer assembly is an integrated package consisting of two eccentrically weighted balance shafts the in-pan oil pump and in-pan oil filter. The balance shafts are gear driven off the crankshaft at twice crankshaft speed. Because the shafts are driven in the opposite direction, the weights counteract engine imbalance. Since there are no timing marks on the balancer or crankshaft gears, it is critical to follow the correct procedure when installing the assembly on the engine. If not properly timed, the balancer may exaggerate engine imbalance. Start by rotating the crankshaft so that the number one cylinder is at top dead center. Then measure from the cylinder block to the first cut of the double notch on the reluctor ring. The dimension should be 42.9 millimeters. Install the balancer so the counterweights are correctly positioned. Finally, using torque angle meter J36660, Tighten the short bolts to 9 foot-pounds plus 75 degrees. 
and the long bolts to 9 foot-pounds plus 90 degrees. The garroter oil pump used on 2.5 liter engines is driven off the backside of the right balance shaft. The inner rotor is driven by the input shaft and has one less tooth than the outer rotor. One chamber between the inner and outer rotor increases in volume as the rotors turn. The vacuum created causes oil to enter through the pump inlet. Oil continues to enter until the chamber reaches a maximum volume. Then the volume of the chamber decreases, causing oil pressure to increase. When the discharge port is uncovered, the oil is forced out of the pump. Because this process occurs for each chamber, a smooth pumping action is produced. There are two critical specifications on the garroter oil pump. The first is gear housing pocket depth, which is measured from the bottom of the pocket to the housing surface. It should be between 13.05 and 13.1 millimeters. The second is gear thickness, which should be between 12.973 and 12.998 millimeters. Before installing the oil pump gears, pack all pump cavities with petroleum jelly to ensure pump priming and prevent engine damage. With the pump cavities packed, assemble the oil pump. The in-pan oil filter attaches directly to the oil pump. It is accessible through the large oil pan drain plug. In 1989, an additional oil drain plug was added for convenience. Like the 2-liter engine, the 2.5-liter uses a cast nodular iron crankshaft supported by five main bearings with the direct ignition system timing disc cast into the crankshaft. The gear teeth used to drive the force balancer assembly are cut next to the timing disc. Piston weight on 2.5-liter engines has been reduced considerably to improve engine efficiency. In addition, piston bearing surfaces are impregnated with silicone to reduce friction. Starting in 1989, 2.5 liter engines use single size pistons. In 1988, connecting rod strength was increased by over 40% as a result of detailed computer analysis of the connecting rod structural design. The 2.5 liter engine uses a cross-flow cast iron cylinder head. For 1989, the intake and exhaust ports have been reworked to provide increased flow and the valve guides have been lengthened for noise reduction. Three steps must be followed when tightening the cylinder head bolts on 2.5 liter engines. First, all bolts should be tightened to 18 foot-pounds in the proper sequence. Second, all bolts except number nine should be tightened to 26 foot-pounds in the same sequence. Retighten number nine to 18 foot-pounds. The third step is to tighten each bolt in sequence an additional one quarter turn or 90 degrees using the torque angle meter. For 1989 engines, several valve train changes have contributed to improved performance. Both intake and exhaust valves have a revised blend angle and a 22 degree back cut. Increased valve stem length helps reduce noise. In addition, camshaft low profile was revised to improve engine breathing. Cam lift for both intake and exhaust valves was increased by 30 thousandths of an inch. On 2.5 liter engines, valve timing is accomplished by a powdered metal crankshaft gear and a phenolic composition camshaft gear with a steel hub. Both gears use helical cut gear teeth. After removing the camshaft thrust plate screws, the camshaft and camshaft gear can be removed through the front of the cylinder block. The timing gear must be pressed from the camshaft using an arbor press. Be sure to position the press plate adapters as close to the camshaft as possible to avoid damaging the camshaft thrust plate. When installing the timing gear, support the camshaft under the front journal and press the timing gear onto the camshaft. Be sure that the gear bottoms against the spacer ring. With the camshaft gear installed, 
measure the end clearance at the thrust plate. Clearance should be 15 to 50 ten thousandths of an inch. If it is less, replace the spacer. If it is more, replace the thrust plate. When installing the camshaft and timing gear, the timing marks on both the camshaft and crankshaft gears must be properly aligned. The intake manifold has been improved by straightening the path to the intake valves and gradually tapering the runner diameters. For 1989, a new intake manifold bolt pattern allows easier assembly. On the other side of the cylinder head is the stainless steel exhaust manifold. When installing the manifold, tighten the bolts in group A to 37 foot-pounds and group B to 32 foot-pounds in the proper sequence. For 1989, a threaded oil filler cap replaces the previously used cap. The threaded cap provides a positive seal, thereby reducing the possibility of oil leaks. When removing the rocker arm cover, use remover J34144A to break the seal. Do not pry on the cover, as this may damage the sealing surface. Including the rocker arm cover, the 2.5 liter engine uses RTV sealer in four areas. A few important guidelines should be followed when using RTV sealer. All oil and old RTV must be removed from sealing surfaces. Clean sealing surfaces with a chlorinated solvent, such as brake clean. Do not use petroleum-based cleaners, as these leave an oily film. Keep RTV sealer out of threaded bolt holes, as it may cause hydraulic lock and prevent the bolt from seating. Assemble components while the RTV is wet, within three minutes after it is applied. Do not wait for it to skin over. The know-how reference manual provides a chart showing the actual bead size for each application. Like the two-liter engine, a single serpentine belt with an automatic tensioner is used to drive the engine accessories. Remember, the belt can be removed by first loosening the automatic tensioner. Both the 2-liter and 2.5-liter engines use the Model 700 throttle body injection or TBI unit. The throttle body controls airflow into the engine through the throttle bore. Throttle shaft dust seals are used on 2.5-liter engines. For 1989, the 2.5-liter engine uses a larger throttle bore for increased performance. Other components located on the throttle body are the throttle position sensor, idle air control valve, and ports that provide vacuum signals for the EGR valve, MAP sensor, and the canister purge system. The throttle position sensor uses a Metripack electrical connector for improved reliability. The sensor is not adjustable. The IAC valve is flange mounted and has a dual taper pintle. The high torque motor allows the ECM to drive the pintle at a faster 320 counts per second rate while still providing reliable operation. The IAC valve also uses a Metripack electrical connector. The IAC valve can be tested electrically with a GM CAMS terminal. Under no circumstances should the pintle be pushed in or pulled out by hand. Doing so may damage the valve. New valves are preset at the factory and should be installed without adjustment. The top part of the TBI unit, or fuel meter body, contains an integral fuel pressure regulator and Multec fuel injector. The pressure regulator maintains pressure within the fuel meter body. On this unit, the pressure regulator diaphragm assembly can be replaced separately. The low impedance multiple technology, or Multec fuel injector, features faster response, improved fuel atomization, lower operating voltage for improved cold weather cranking, and the ability to operate cleanly on any gasoline blend. The injector uses a ball type valve and director plate to meter pressurized fuel into the engine. The finish on the ball and seat is extremely smooth, providing a precise seal to prevent hot start problems and reduce evaporative emissions. Minimum idle speed is the only adjustment possible on the TBI unit. 
Idle speed is determined by the position of the throttle and the IAC valve. An improperly set minimum idle speed forces the ECM to compensate by changing the IAC pintle position. If minimum idle speed is set too high, the ECM extends the pintle, causing it to bottom against the valve seat. If set too low, the ECM retracts the pintle, which may cause the vehicle to not start during cold weather or to stall during warm-up. To adjust minimum idle speed, start by removing the stop screw plug using a scratch awl or similar tool. Next, ground the diagnostic terminal on the ALDL connector and turn the ignition to the on position. Wait 45 seconds to allow the IAC pintle to extend and seat in the throttle body. Then, with the ignition on, disconnect the IAC connector and remove the ground from the diagnostic terminal. With a tachometer connected, start the engine. The tachometer should read 600 RPMs, plus or minus 50 RPMs. If it does not, adjust the idle stop screw to bring engine speed within specification. After minimum idle speed is set, use RTV sealer to cover the idle stop screw hole. The direct ignition system, or DIS, used on both the 2-liter and 2.5-liter engines, consists of the ignition coils, ignition module, and crankshaft sensor. On 2-liter engines, the sensor is mounted on the engine block and can be replaced by simply disconnecting the connector and removing the sensor from the block. On 2.5-liter engines, the sensor is attached to the bottom of the module. To replace the sensor, the DIS assembly must first be removed. The crank sensor aligns with a reluctor or timing disc cast into the crankshaft. The outside of the reluctor has seven machine slots. Six of the slots are equally spaced 60 degrees apart, and the seventh slot is spaced 10 degrees from the sixth. As the reluctor rotates, the slots cross the magnetic field of the sensor. The six equally spaced slots are used to indicate engine speed, and the seventh slot informs the module of crankshaft position. The signal produced by the seventh slot is sometimes referred to as the sink pulse. Two ignition coils are attached to the DIS module. The DIS system uses a waste spark method of spark distribution, which means each coil simultaneously provides the spark for two spark plugs. Cylinders one and four are fired together, and cylinders two and three are fired together. Since spark occurs as one cylinder is on the compression stroke and the other is on the exhaust, most of the energy is used to fire the spark plug in the cylinder on compression. The DIS module controls primary current to the ignition coils. It also sends a reference signal to the ECM based on input from the crank sensor. The ECM uses this signal to maintain spark timing and to pulse the fuel injector. The coil firing sequence begins after the module recognizes the sync pulse from the crank sensor. The second pulse following the sync pulse signals the module to fire the 2-3 ignition coil, and the fifth pulse signals the module to fire coil 1-4. Under 400 RPM, the DIS module controls spark timing. After the engine reaches about 400 RPM, the ECM sends a 5-volt signal to the module on the bypass circuit, which switches control of spark timing to the ECM. At this point, the ECM signals the DIS module to fire the coils on the EST, or electronic spark timing circuit. If a failure occurs in either the bypass or EST circuits, the engine continues to run but spark timing is controlled by the DIS module, and code 42 is set. When troubleshooting the DIS for an engine cranks but won't run, or no start condition, it is important to isolate the ignition system from other possible causes. To do this, disconnect one spark plug wire at a time and install spark tester ST125. Be sure to connect the spark tester to a good engine ground. Then, crank the engine while observing the tester. Repeat this test for each spark plug wire. Testing for spark may result in one of three possible conditions. 
The first condition, spark at each plug wire, indicates that the DIS is producing adequate voltage to fire the spark plug. Check for foul spark plugs or other possible causes of the no start condition. The second condition is no spark at one or more plug wires. The most probable cause of this condition is the spark plug wires or if two plug wires on the same coil do not fire, an ignition coil. Start by checking plug wire resistance with an ohmmeter. Replace any wire that measures more than 30,000 ohms. If resistance is okay, check the ignition coil. Check coil secondary winding with an ohmmeter. Resistance across the coil towers should be 5,000 to 7,000 ohms. Then check for continuity between the coil towers and ground. Continuity between the coil towers and ground indicates that the coil is inoperative. If the coil tests okay, remove the coil and check for evidence of carbon tracking or terminal damage. Next, test the DIS primary circuit operation. Connect the test light between the coil terminals on the DIS module. The test light should blink with the engine cranking. If it does not, replace the DIS module. The third condition, no spark on all plug wires, indicates a problem at either the DIS module or crank sensor. In this case, the first step is checking for power and ground at the DIS module. To do this, remove the two-pin connector at the module. Then, with the ignition on, connect the digital voltmeter between connector terminals A and B. If the meter does not read battery voltage, check for an open in the power circuit or ground circuit. If it does, check for a faulty crank sensor. The procedure for checking the crank sensor is slightly different for 2-liter and 2.5-liter engines. On 2-liter engines, measure the resistance between terminal A and C on the 3-pin connector. The ohmmeter should read between 900 and 1200 ohms. If it does not, replace the crank sensor. If it does, connect a digital voltmeter between the connector terminals A and C. With the meter in the 2-volt AC position, crank the engine and observe the voltmeter. The voltage pulses should be greater than a tenth of a volt. If not, replace the crank sensor. If they are, replace the DIS module. To test the crank sensor on 2.5 liter engines, first remove the DIS coil and module assembly from the engine. Then remove the crank sensor from the module and measure the resistance between the sensor terminals with an ohmmeter in the 2000 ohm position. If the meter does not read between 800 to 900 ohms, replace the sensor. If it does, rest a flat steel tool against the tip of the sensor. This verifies that the sensor is still magnetized. If it has lost its magnetism, replace the sensor. If not, replace the DIS module. Over the years, Buick 2-liter and 2.5-liter engines have earned the reputation for dependable service. While a lot of attention is focused on new products, it's the proven performers that generate real excitement.